uh, chapter two is the application layer. Remember we talked about a model. A model is a, a simplified representation of something that's more complex. We use it as a way to, to try to understand something that, that tends to be uh, relatively complex. And, and so we're going to start talking about the application layer, which is the highest layer. It's the layer that's closest to us as, as users, and that's what we tend to see. It does get a little bit confusing, though, because it uses the word application on it. So when we talk about the application layer, we're not talking about the applications that we're using. We're talking about the protocols that get used at that particular layer of the, uh, of the Internet model. So this chapter, we talk about application architectures. We'll, we'll talk about host-based, client-based, and client-server-based. Uh, I, I really wish they had referred to as host-based as server-based. I think it would be a little bit more intuitive for you. So when you see host-based, think server-based. It will make more sense to you, I think. Uh, and then we'll talk about which one's best. Because you know, in reality, there's not a best. There's you know, one that's better in a particular situation. But it really depends on what you're familiar with, the application that you're applying it to, things like that. Uh, then we'll kind of look at the application layer as it functions, as it works. How does it work? Uh, so we'll start out, we'll look fairly closely at the World Wide Web and email specifically because those are applications that, as users, we tend to use a lot. So we'll talk about those and kind of go through how, how those uh, uh, different systems actually work. And then we will uh, kind of briefly touch on FTP, Telnet, instant messaging, etc. Okay. So the application layer. When we talk about application architecture, the way in which the functions of the application layer software are spread among the clients and the servers on the network. Like I said, it's the very top layer of our, of our internet model. It's the part that's closer to us as end users. When we type in an address into a browser, for example, we're putting it on the HTTP protocol to go down the various layers across the wire and then up the various layers to the web server. So when we talk about the, the different functions that happen at the application layer, we can look at them, one of the ways we can look at them are where these, these different functions are actually performed. Data storage, data access, application, and presentation logic, where these different functions are actually performed. And that kind of gives us an idea of where most of the processing is being done, how much demand that's going to place on our, on, on our network, things like that. So data storage just refers to where we're going to store the data. Are we going to store that at, at, at a server end of things, or are we going to store that on the client end of things? Data access logic really says how we're going to go about accessing those particular files. You know, SQL commands, for example, is that going to go across, you know, how, how we're going to actually understand what the contents of the file is. It's not enough to know where the file is, what the name of the file is, that type of thing. It's knowing exactly where the different ones and zeros in that file represent the actual data versus the ones and zeros that are in that file that represent the header information, things like that, about the file. And that's the data access logic. Application logic really are business rules. So we might have a business rule that you can't place orders after 6 p.m. or in, in this class, uh, for example, the, the homework assignments, it's kind of a business rule that they, they have to be done by 11.59 on, on Sunday nights. Uh, so it's a, it's a logic rule that we apply to in our code. Um, presentation logic is basically how is the logic created on, with respect to presentation for the layout of our screen, the text boxes, the colors that are used, where the text is placed, and stuff like that. So depending on where these things, these different pieces of, uh, these different functions occur, that kind of gives us a clue as to uh, how to, to look at, the, uh, at, at our architecture, gives us different perspectives of, of the demands that are going to be placed on our particular uh, architecture. So these, all these, these four uh, functions are going to occur either on the servers, on the clients, or a combination between the two. And the reality is it's always a combination of the two. It's just which, which way is it, 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 does it, which end of the spectrum does it tend to lean towards. Application architecture determine uh, by how many functions application programs are spread among the clients and servers. So in a host-based architecture, remember I said, think of that as a server-based architecture. In a server-based or host-based architecture, most of those functions are going to be performed where? On the server. It does most of the work. In a client-based architecture, the reverse of that, the other end of the spectrum, is, is how that works. 
Most of those functions are going to be done on the client. And then in the client-server environment, you share. Those various functions are spread out across, uh, fairly evenly across the, the server and the client. So again, with host-based or server-based, the server may be doing, performing presentation logic, application logic, data access logic, and data storage. This is a very extreme case. You're normally not going to see something like this. But the client is really nothing more than a screen and a keyboard. It has no ability to store any files. There are no applications or anything like that that runs on it. Everything, all it has are literally screenshots. Everything is generated over here on the server. Anybody see any problems with that? What are some of the problems? What are some of the, the uh, disadvantages of that approach? What happens if there's a break in the wire? If the server goes down, everything goes down. If the wire breaks, you know, somebody cuts through the wire with a backhoe, you're down. Those clients can't do anything. One client, a thousand clients, none of them do anything. Scalability is an issue too. Usually on something like this, you're probably talking about a mainframe. It's usually the approach that mainframes use. Is, it is, uh, they use terminals. And if you happen to be using a mainframe, mainframes aren't like a server. You don't go out and buy a, a server for ten thousand or a mainframe for ten thousand dollars. You can buy a fairly good server for ten thousand dollars. Mainframes, the, the increments to upgrade tend to be much more expensive. So you, there's not a case of a, of a little upgrade when it comes to this, this approach. So it doesn't tend to be very scalable. You're really dependent on your network connection. Uh, but there's advantages too. What are some of those advantages? If we're not installing software here... Be cheaper. Pardon? Time computers will be cheaper because... Yeah. Nothing like... They don't need their own hard drive and all. Yep. It's a lot cheaper over here. No hard drives. You probably have less memory. If, if You know, probably have very little memory. Um, there's probably very little in the way of hardware on this end. So you're going to save money there. You're going to save money over here in terms of some of the maintenance. You don't have to come out here and load applications all the time. All you have to do is load applications on the server, you're done. Those applications are automatically seen out here because it's pushed across the network. So maintenance can be, can be cheaper. And that's what this screen is, is talking about, some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages of that approach. Uh, it, it is a very traditional approach uh, because we did kind of evolve from mainframes. Uh, having said that, there is a push to kind of go back to that model. Instead of using mainframes, uh, in some cases we still use mainframes. In other cases, we use servers that we, we log into remotely um, uh, through virtual networks. But at the same time, uh, through virtual machines, I should say. But at the same time, um, you know, there's there are those that really still like having clients, uh, thick clients, clients that are able to perform uh, in case the network goes down. And client-based architecture takes a little bit different approach. Most of those functions are done on the client side of things. And of course, that kind of has the flip side of the advantages we just got through talking about. If your wire goes down, somebody cuts through the wire by accident, for the most part, your client can continue to do work. Now, obviously, it can't access the network. It can't access files because data storage is done over here at this point. So it can't access those. But anything that it has locally on that machine can continue to function. So again, if you've got a thousand workers in, in this particular uh, uh, architecture, probably a, a pretty good deal of them could continue to function depending on what they're trying to do and, and exactly how files are, are stored and things like that. At the same time, on the maintenance side of things, now you're having to you know, manage applications on all these clients. All those clients have additional hardware. They have to have more memory. They have to have full operating systems. They have to have hard drives all those types of things to be able to function. So some of your maintenance stuff goes up. And uh, something else that's wrong with that particular environment, if you're storing files on the file server, what you're doing is you're placing a heavy demand across your network. Screenshots in the previous architecture, screenshots are really easy. They don't take up much room as far as bandwidth on your, on your network. But if you're having to load files across your network, that can be problematic if you start talking about very large files. 
So if it happen, happens to be a company that is processing lar large images or they're processing large databases, it becomes very problematic. A better approach tends to be the client-server architecture when you're in that type of situation if you happen to have a database. Why? Because your client can access a database across the network and only open up individual tables. It's so only the individual pieces of data that it actually needs rather than an entire database that gets transferred across. But that's because you're splitting the various functions. So they, they work in tandem. So that's what a client-server architecture does is it kind of splits the difference. Some of the work is done on the server side of things. Some of the work is done on the client side of things. And in that environment, you have some of the advantages but some of those disadvantages as well. Again, if your wire gets broken for some reason, you can do some things on your client. You just probably can't do everything. Um, again, if you happen to have some really large files, there may be occasions where it may place greater demand on your on your infrastructure. But for the most part, because of the client server infrastructure or client server environment with the two applications working together, most of the time they work together to be able to minimize that. And so the advantages and disadvantages of that. So any questions so far? Everybody kind of got a, a grasp on that? Okay. Middleware, I think you asked a question about middleware earlier in the semester. I thought you did. It was a couple weeks ago, I thought. Maybe not. Um, oh, middle, yeah, I did last week. <laughs> middleware is a, a, a kind of a unique class of software that, for the most part, most people don't ever have to mess with. Uh, unless you get into, uh, well, actually your position, you, you, you might have to, to get into that type of stuff. But middleware is basically a piece of software that resides between two exist or two, two, uh, two other pieces of software. Normally what happens, the reason you normally apply a piece of middleware is normally you, you will have a legacy application. Something where you've got a lot of time, money, and invested in that application. And as a result, you've got a lot of data. So think about school, for example. We've got a lot of student data dating back you know, years and years and years. You don't just get rid of that. It may not be easy to convert all that data over into some kind of new format that can be read by you know, current uh, uh, programming languages. So in that type of environment, if we want to be able to add a new piece of software that provides some additional functionality, those two may not be able to talk to each other because our legacy software is so old. In those cases, we can usually apply a piece of middleware that will do a conversion for us. It will allow the newer software to be able to read the data in that older application. It usually is not something you just go out to the store and buy. It's usually something you have application developers come in and develop an application that actually performs this function. So again, it's not something you're going to go to Best Buy and say, hey, yeah, I need middleware, give it to me. It doesn't work quite that, that easily. But it is something that will allow you to still take advantage, to take advantage of newer pieces of software without having to get rid of your legacy software and, and still be able to use that old data. Is, is, I've heard of the term SCORM. Is that the same SCORM? SCORM? S-C-O-R-M. I don't think so. Okay. I'd have, I'd have to look into it, but I don't believe so. Okay. Um, let's see. Multi-tier architectures. So what we've talked about is we've really tried to keep the architectures pretty simple, right? We've talked about server or host base. We talked about client server, which is two tiered. We've talked about host, uh, um, client based architectures. So that's just a, a basic two tier architecture. There's the client, and the server. Three tier architecture is a little bit more complicated. We're going to throw in another layer. Why might we want to do that? We'll talk about that here in just a second. In tier architecture just means we're going to throw in additional layers, four or more. So with a three tier architecture, we still have our client. That's us for the most part. We tend to access uh, access a web server. So maybe we're accessing a web server here. And in most cases, when we access a web server, especially if it's an e-commerce site, it's Google or it's something like that. Very rarely does that web server actually have anything other than a web server running on it. Why? Because it's receiving so many requests, it can't handle any additional tasks. So it needs to focus just on web server requests. But it's got to give back information from a database. Google is nothing more than a huge database. So it's got to get information back through that web server from a database. 
that tends to be the next tier, another tier. So we can break up some of the responsibilities on the server side in order to be able to handle more requests. And interior architecture is just doing the same thing. It's adding additional layers. We may have, in this case, a web server. We may have a, some other type of application server here, something that's serving up, say, videos or something like that. And we may still have a database on the back end as well. So it's a way to distribute the workload across multiple computers in order to be able to handle a, a bigger load. So advantage, advantages of multi-tier, better load balancing, it's more scalable. Again, relative to mainframe, servers are cheap. If, if you really require that much more uh, uh, processing power, you just buy another server. It's not a huge deal. Uh, disadvantages, heavily loaded network. And when we say heavily loaded network, we're not talking about the server, we're talking about the wire. Whether it's fiber optic, it's cable, it's, it's, it's wireless. We're sending a lot of data across, across it. Why? Because instead of just the client server that we might have in a two-tier going across this one wire, we're generating that traffic, but now we're adding additional traffic here, additional traffic here. These two have to communicate back and forth. Same thing here, back and forth, and then back and forth. So we're generating a lot more traffic across, across the actual network. Uh, and because of the, the increased complexity, it, it's a lot more difficult to be able to test applications because now you're talking about software here that has to communicate with software here that has to communicate with software here. So you're not talking about a bunch of software on one single system. You're talking about software on systems that may be distributed across the office, across town, across the state, across the country, across the world. So troubleshooting some of those issues sometimes can be very, very difficult. So that can, that can be one of the disadvantages. And this goes back into something you mentioned last week, too, that the distinction between thick and thick clients. When we say that all those, those different uh, functions are on the client side, that's a thick client. That client's doing all that work. If it's a thin client, that means we've shifted all those functions over to the server side. That's a thin client. It doesn't fit real neatly in here, but it's it, it's you know as good a place as any to put it. Is the concept of a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, and that doesn't quite fit with either one of the, the previous ones, uh, other than perhaps client-server, with the exception of in a client-server environment, the server has a role of dominating the clients. It provides access to files or denies access to files. So there's a lot more control in a client-server environment. In a peer-to-peer -peer environment, there is, isn't that relationship. Every client has the same stature, if you will. They, they have the same rights to files or not lack of rights to files. Uh, so it, it's something that's really grown in popularity, number one, in, in a local area network. It's a, it's a type of network architecture that's very easy to implement um, and cheap to implement. So you tend to see it a lot in small offices, small businesses, or home uh, homes. Um, but you also see peer-to-peer -peer networks on the internet. Napster was an example, BitTorrent. Uh, there, there's you know, several different examples that are out there. The down, the advantages are you're sharing files, obviously. And for legal purposes, that's a great thing to do, and, and, and uh, it's very easy, and it's just a way to really get access to files around the world very easily. At the same time, finding data sometimes can be difficult. If you've got three computers that are shared in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, you only have two places to go check. If you're connected to 10,000 computers in a peer-to-peer -peer environment and you've got to find a file, get a cup of coffee I and mean, you're going to be there a while. Uh, at the same time, disadvantages are also include security issues, especially when you talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks that operate in the Internet environment. Um, great, so you finally found that, that file, you download it, that's going to be the one with the virus on it. So it, it tends to be very uh, um, difficult in terms of, of providing security in that type of environment. Criteria for choosing an architecture. Which one's the best one? There's not a best one. There never is. It's what's the best one for your application, for your environment, for what your needs as an organization are. So the infrastructure cost, cost of servers, clients, and the circuits. Remember, if you've got thin clients, you're probably going to have to invest more in your circuits and your servers. Why? Because the servers are doing more of the processing. 
Uh, mainframes, again, they're very expensive and you don't upgrade them a little. I mean, $100,000 is probably an upgrade to a mainframe. You can, that's 10 servers, uh, 10 pretty good servers. Um, terminals can be inexpensive. So, you know, so where do you want to spend your costs? So there's that side of things. There's a the money side of things. The development costs, mainly the cost of software development if you're, if you're developing software. If you're, um, depending on the environment that you're in, if you have to develop specialized applications because that's something that you require, whatever business you happen to be in, maybe the defense department or something like that, you may have the need for very specialized software. If that's the case, a, uh, a host-based or server-based solution is probably a pretty good choice. Why? Because you only have to develop it for that, that mainframe. You develop it for one, one type of environment, it gets pushed out to all those terminals. Any updates get done are automatically pushed out to all the clients. If, on the other hand, you've got that same need and you have an architecture where it's client-based, now if all those clients aren't exactly the same, You've got to develop it for each one of those different platforms, so your development costs go way up. So in, in that type of environment, you probably want to use as much off-the-shelf software as you can get, something you can go to Best Buy and buy Office, for example, or, or Peachtree, or whatever it happens to be. So again, it depends on your needs, at, depending on the industry that you're in, the type of company that you are. And then scalability, the ability to increase or decrease computing capacity as needed. So again, mainframes, you don't tend to increment you know, your, your, them a little bit. You spend a lot of money for, it's kind of a step function. So if you need an increase in, in computing power, you're going to have a pretty significant jump, but it's going to cost you. So you, you can't increase a little bit with a mainframe environment. So I used to have a professor, in, a logistics professor. Uh, logistics was my PhD minor. And I had a professor that said, every question can be answered what? in a 3x3 three three matrix. Well, it's not a 3x3 three three matrix, but you know, it's a 4x4, four four, close enough. And that will answer your questions as far as which one's the best. You ought to analyze the, tip, the type of environment that you're in, and you ought to be able to go to this and say, okay, well, which one do we want? Is cost of infrastructure a big deal to us? Is cost of development a big deal? Is scalability? Which, which ones are our major priorities? And based on that, you ought to be able to determine which type of architecture probably would suit you best. Any questions? Those are the, the general architectures. And again, those are theoretical architectures. Those are theoretical ways of looking at our network and where the work is going to be done on, on client, server, or shared. Um, as far as the actual applications that are running across the application network, we've got the two common ones are the World Wide Web and email. Those are the ones that we see every day that you use all the time. But there's a lot of others, and they, they listed you know a few others here. But there's really, I mean, there, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of, of different types of things that are running at the application layer. We just don't tend to think about them because they run in the background. So the World Wide Web, two basic uh, uh, components that really started: the idea of hypertext and URLs. And if you talk to some people, they'll say Al Gore invented the internet. If you talk to other people, they'll say Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet, or invented the web anyway. In reality, there was actually an idea back in the mid-40s, a guy that wrote a book, and he had this idea of a collective community, a collective knowledge base. And it was really kind of the forerunner to the idea of hyperlinks, to be able to link documents, you know, related terms in one document to a related term in another document. That's really kind of where the idea for hyperlinks came from. Tim Berners-Lee kind of took that idea and applied it to the Internet. And, of course, the rest is, is history. He ended up with Mosaic coming out in, in 93. First graphical really kind of gave us a graphical use of the Internet. Um, now, keep in mind, when we talk about the Internet versus the World Wide Web, they're two distinct different things. The Internet is really the infrastructure that we have all this data that moves around. Part of the internet is the World Wide Web, it's email, it's you know, news groups. It, there's a lot of different types of services that are offered on the internet. When we say the World Wide Web, we're specifically talking about documents that are linked together via hyperlinks. It's that graphical part of the internet that we're, we're used to seeing all the time. 
So how the web works? Well, basically, to simplify it as much as I can, there's basically two steps that occur when you when you, you go to use an internet the internet. Uh, so you open up a web browser and you'll either click on a link or you'll type in an address and hit enter, and it'll take you to to a location. That's referred to as an HTTP request. You're requesting some kind of a resource on a server somewhere. The response is referred to as the HTTP response. That's the web server reading that request and then responding appropriately. Um, let's stay here for just a second. So basically, yeah, you'll type that in. You might click and you know, click on a link. Either one's going to go through the same processes and come over here to the server and then read that request and then respond to it in kind. That request is made up of multiple parts. You've got the request line, which is required. That includes the command, the URL, and the HTTP version number. So it's a get command. We want to get a particular file. You're going to, you're going to give it the address that you're trying to, to retrieve. And then you're going to try to negotiate or you're going to tell the web server what version of HTTP you understand. Why? Because we have to speak the same language. If we don't speak the same language, we can't communicate. So the web browser is going to tell the web server that it's trying to talk to, this is a version of HTTP that I understand. Use, please use that when you try to communicate back with me. Then you've got the request header, which is optional. It's not always included. But it gives information like the browser, browser type, version number, things like that, the date. That's information, especially on the server side of things, that as a webmaster you can really find useful. It gives you information about who's accessing your site, the type of browser that's being used. Um, so you can uh, uh, modify your site for the users that are accessing your site. You want to make sure if most people are using Internet Explorer, you want to optimize your site for Internet Explorer. Um, and then you've got the only required, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, not the only, this is the other optional part, the request body. And that's optional. You're not always going to have that. If there's form data, you know, for example, you had a form that you filled out and you hit enter or you hit, uh, hit enter on the keyboard, you click enter or hit, click submit, that's what that's referring to. It's actually sending additional data, not just the request, but additional data back to that web server. So you're not always going to have that because most of the time, unless you're filling out a form, you're not going to have that. So that's what it might actually look like if you were listening to it with a sniffer, if you're actually watching the data go across the wire. So you've got your, di uh, your git command. You've got a typo here, but what he's re it's supposed to be AR uh, Dennis. Um, and you'll see that here in just a minute on the, the uh, response, HTTP response. But this is his directory, and this is the actual file name, home.htm. That's a specific file, just like any Word file that you might see, Excel file. This just happens to be an HTML document, but home.htm, and then it's telling you that it's using HTTP as a protocol version 1.1. This directory and this file are located on this host. And then it gives you the information about the date, the user agent, using probably Firefox, Mozilla, and then the URL. So in this case, this isn't always going to be here. If he had typed in the address, that would not be there. He clicked on this link from somewhere. Or he clicked on the, he was clicking on the link for this from here. So that's referred to as the, re the referring site. Again, if you type in the address, that doesn't show up. If you click on a link, it shows up. Again, from a, a server's perspective, or excuse me, from a server's perspective, a webmaster's perspective, you like it when people click on links. Why? You find out where they're coming from. It gives you information about your users. Where are they coming from? That GET request goes down the various layers of our internet model. The application, the transfer protocol, IP protocol goes all the way down our different layers, down to the wire, goes across the internet, that cloud that we always hear about on in the commercials, it does the exact same thing in reverse on the server side of things. It goes through those various layers, stripping off the various header information from the different packets, different uh, layers, until it gets back up to the application layer, and the web server says, oh, this is an HTTP uh, request. I need to interpret that. So the, HTTP, or the web server says, okay, this is the, the HTTP version number. I can, I can do that. I can speak that language. Status code, reason, again, optional stuff. Other, uh, in the response header, information on the server, date, URL, URL of the page ret retrieved. Those are both optional. Then there's the actual part of the page that, as a user, we wanted. 
So it's the actual content of the page. So this is how you know there was a typo in the previous one. He, so he typed this stuff out rather than, than copying and paste. Uh, again, you've got the version up there. You've got a 200 response. Most people are familiar. They've heard about 400, 404s. 404 is the, the resource cannot be found. In this case, it responded with a 200, which means it found that resource. What do I mean when I say resource? What are you for? That file. We were looking for that file. That's the resource. It found it. The web server said, yes, I've got that resource. I can return that to you. It provides a date, the server version. It's on an Apache server. It gives you the location of that file, that file we were looking for, home.htm. It's got this directory information here. Same typo there. Somewhere was. Where did I see that? Somewhere else I saw another spelling of that directory. I won't worry about it right now. Uh, then it talks about the content type that it's an HTML text because that's how it interprets that data as it's going across HTTP. And then you actually have the body of the email, the, the part that the web browser is interpreting and presenting to you, and that's what you end up seeing on, on the page. So that's a process of how that, how when you type in an address, how that actually works. You type it in, it goes down those different layers, across the wire, back up those layers so that the web server can interpret it. HTML is the language that that, that browser is interpreting. It, HTML, the browser understands that as a language and that tells it where to lay out various components on a page, what colors to use, what font, what you know, type of, of text to use, etc. Uh, it's a language that's been around for a while, and it's you know being phased out. It's not something that's being used an awful lot more. Why? Because it's static. What do we mean when we say static? It doesn't change. It doesn't change. We're, we're manually typing it in. It's not being updated from a database. Um, so you end up with a lot of outdated information that way. You also end up with, by using HTML, a lot of content that looks significantly different from one browser to the next, one environment to the next. Um, so that's some of the problems with HTML. So you're seeing additional markup languages being developed or being used that help to alleviate some of those problems. Uh, so you end up with XML, XHTML, things like that that really try to address some of those issues. So that's the World Wide Web. That's the simpler example of the two that we spend time going into. Any questions over that? Email functions similarly from a distance, but as you start to look at it a little bit closer, it gets more complicated. There's a lot more protocols when it comes to email, even you know, simple, simple, uh, simple email. One of the protocols, or the main protocol, the one that's been around the longest, is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Um, to really understand how it all works, you kind of have to think of some of the different players. And in this, play, in this case, we're talking about a two-tier system here. So there's a client and a server. So we're not talking about web-based email at this point. So make sure everybody understands that at first. In this environment, we've got two players. We've got a, a, a user agent and a transfer agent. So a, a mail user agent is a client. It's going to be Microsoft Outlook or Eudora or something like that. It's a program that we have on our, on our client machine that allows us to create emails, uh, receive emails, usually has some kind of contact list built in, all the stuff you expect, uh, as opposed to the mail transfer agent is an application that runs on a server. That's what's actually going to accept an incoming email and forward it to other email servers until it gets to its destination. The reason you have to kind of understand this part is because unlike uh, uh, web, the web, which uses HTTP all the way from the client to the server, that's not how it works when it comes to email. When it comes to email, you use SMTP on the originating sender side to create that email and send it to the, the original server. That server uses S, SMTP to forward that to additional servers. And then when it reaches its destination server, not the client, but the destination server, it stops. We don't use SMTP anymore from, that, from then on. At that point, for the user on the receiving side to re retrieve that email, they use usually one of two protocols, either POP, POP is what most people call it, or IMAP. POP is the original one. It's, it's the older one. Uh, 
Um, and what it basically allowed you to do is you logged into your email server, you downloaded your email messages, and once you downloaded it, it was gone. It wasn't on the email server anymore. That meant that that email message then resided only on that client machine. Well, that was fine when you know everybody had one computer, and so you didn't have either, you didn't have mobile computers, you didn't have five computers at home, you weren't accessing email from different locations all the time. Um, but when you did start having that type of environment, that was a problem. You had to know where you downloaded your email to the last time to be able to check that email that you downloaded. So that was that was one of the real problems with that approach. IMAP is a, a, a more recent protocol, and I say more recent, it's not new. It's been around for quite some time at this point. But it was a step up from that. It allowed you to leave those messages on the server. So now you can go back to any other client and still look at those same email messages. When you got ready to get rid of that email message, you could hit delete. That would delete it from the server. It was gone from all your clients that you happen to be accessing it from. But again, this is a client-server environment. We're not talking about web-based email yet. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, there are some other standards, but for the most part, those are the primary, those are the main protocols that tend to get used uh, for, for email. So again, that was a, a two-tier two email architecture. Um, and we already talked a little bit about the user agent versus mail transfer agent. When we talk about the user agent, we're talking about the, the client email uh, application, Eudora, Outlook, etc. versus the transfer agent, some kind of mail server. There's open source mail servers, HMail, I think is one. Um, there's Exchange Server, Microsoft's uh, email server. So there's a lot of different ones out there, but those are the different clients and, and the different servers that, that, that work together. The host-based email architecture or server-based uh, uh, architecture um, is, is a little bit different approach, and I'm not going to talk about this all that much, but the idea is going back to what we talked about at the beginning, when everything's done on the server. What do you think that means? If you're accessing email just through screenshots, so everything's up on the server. And you know, that's an approach that doesn't get used all that much anymore, but just be aware that that, that does exist. Now, for the one that you probably tend to use the most, some type of web-based email. Everybody use Gmail? Seems to be really popular. Um, here we use uh, Exchange. You, you can use a client on campus, um, but if you're off campus, you, I believe you have to actually use uh, web-based email to access your email. And uh, so it tends to get used for that very reason. It's very portable. You can access your email from anywhere in the world. But it adds an additional step in both on both the client side and on the, the uh, receiving sending side and the receiving side. So on the client side, depending on which side you want to start with, you're going to send an email message across the internet just like you would any other web request. It has nothing to do with email. And that email server then translates that into an S SMTP message to be able to communicate with that email server. Because remember, email servers understand SMTP. And then it processes, it goes through just like the, 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 the traditional email system that we just got through talking about, to the other side where it does the same thing in reverse. The email server has to convert that back to something that the web server understands, and then it can communicate back with the client. So you're just adding an additional step. It makes things more complicated, it certainly creates the opportunity for more errors to occur. It places more stress on our network, but it's something that users tend to demand because we know how to use a browser. We like the ability to go anywhere and be able to access our email. So it's it's kind of a trade-off. We add complexity for more usability. So does that mean the server, the web server, has all the content that we send from one user to another. They have like, all the emails. Yeah, it, it, that data is going through the web server. So they have a copy of, of the emails. Yes, and the, the, one of the reasons that you hear, for example, never put usernames, passwords, credit cards, social security numbers in email is unless you specifically encrypt email, email is sent in plain text. So unless you have some kind of add-on product that encrypts your email, it's in plain text. So don't do that. 
So I guess that's what you're getting at, is the security well, side I'm just, of it? Just more like, you know, okay, so we use Gmail. Um, we, I'm just thinking where does the content actually, where is it stored or where is it kept? Well, ideally, uh, it would just go straight through the server. It's just facilitated by the web server. It's passed on straight to the email server. But the reality is you have lots of, of snapshots, backlog, uh, logs, and, and backups that get generated. There's usually a copy of something that you had at some point in time somewhere. Now, finding it, it's a different issue, but it's usually out there somewhere. Um, like I said, it adds to the complexity of, of the network and the demands on the network, but because of the functionality of it, it's web-based web email is very popular. So an example, uh, uh, SMTP message. Uh, let's see. So again, you see some of the same type of information that you might think about. The header information, which gives you information like where it's from, who it's to, date, subject, a message ID, which should be unique for every single message that goes across those servers, and then data. And that's what allows you to determine whether or not a message been, has been spoofed or not. Uh, you can compare different messages, and if it's, a, if it's got the same uh, the same ID, then it's, it's something's been spoofed. And then you have the actual body of the message itself. Now, email's been around a long time, a lot longer than the web. And when it was originally designed, it wasn't designed to transfer anything other than text. Email was originally designed to transfer text back and forth as an asynchronous uh, communication tool to be able to say, hey, I found this uh, uh, article about uh, such and such, go check your library for it. You know, academicians sharing information with one another. Uh, and it was great in that environment, but they really couldn't foresee the changes that the internet was going to go on, uh, undergo and the commercialization of the internet and this idea that we need to be able to email documents, we need to be able to email pictures, we need to be able to send HTML um, um, email rather than just text email. And as a result, we had to somehow augment traditional email because we already had that infrastructure in place and yet at the same time be able to take advantage of attachments and things like that. And that's where MIME comes in, comes in multi-purpose internet mail extension. Essentially the way it works is on your client side of things, when you go to create an email, it looks at that and says, oh, wait a minute, SMTP does not understand you know, a Word document. It doesn't know what that Word document means. It can't do anything with that Word document. It converts that document into ones and zeros so that all it looks like is text to your email client. So now SMTP can send it across its network using that protocol and as, at that point it just looks like a really big text uh, email. It goes all the way through our traditional email system just like that. On the receiving end, the email client looks at that and says, oh wait a minute, there's some code in here that says there's mine, that mine is part of this email. It then reconverts that back to its original file so that you can receive that attachment. So it doesn't come as something that's separate in your email. It's, it's, it's something that gets converted twice, once on the receiving or once on the sending end, and once on the receiving end. That's why every now and then you end up, you know, as good as our networks are, as good as they've become over the years, uh, in terms of speed and quality, you do occasionally get a, a corrupt a corrupt file. So that's why you start doing conversions like that, you're gonna, gonna end up with some corruption. Listservs are kind of a, a special extension to emails. Um, they basically serve as kind of a bulletin board, a place where you can talk about various subjects. It's usually a, 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 a type of email where you can have bulk emails sent out to a group of people that have subscribed to a list. And that subscription is usually based on some kind of interest. You're interested in networking. You're interested in conferences. You're interested in, in, in you know, whatever, cars. You can subscribe to a listserv that's, that caters to that community, and depending on the, the criteria for that particular, particular listserv, they may send you out messages once a day, once a week, once a year. Um, they may be little updates. They may be huge files. You, you have no way of knowing. Uh, but that's something that people that are interested in that particular topic, it's, it's a way for them to kind of interact, stay in touch with other people that have similar interests. Um, they don't get used an awful lot anymore. Um, but they, they are still used, so um, something to kind of
kind of be aware of, a lot of, of groups that use listservs have kind of just shifted away from listservs and gone to just directly to sending out bulk email. Um, and so the distinctions are pretty subtle between the two. So those are really the main two protocols, the, the, the web, or excuse me, the email uh, 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 protocols that get used, and the World Wide Web. Those are the ones that we see every day, we see on a daily basis, we use all the time. But there's lots and lots and lots of other, uh, other protocols that operate at the application layer. And the book finishes up at the end of the chapter. It talks about just briefly some of those individual ones, uh, some of the more popular of those less popular ones, if you will. So FTP is a pretty common one. It gets used to transfer files back and forth. It tends to be more efficient than sending a file via HTTP. Why don't we use FTP, right? It's more efficient. Well, FTP doesn't do as good a job in terms of a lot of the error checking and stuff like that. It's very, it tends to be faster because it has less overhead. So it's a different between, difference between the two. Um, you have to have an application program and a server to be able to do it. So you have to have an FTP server and an FTP client to be able to use it. There's a lot of them, both clients and servers, that are uh, available for free. In other cases, you, you can, can, can purchase them. And as far as accessing the sites, there's two types of sites. There's closed sites, and then there's anonymous sites. Anonymous sites you don't see nearly as often as you, as you used to. You used to see virtually every corporation, for example, a lot of computer companies had anonymous sites. Why? They were trying to provide access to their drivers. A lot of drivers online, the World Wide Web wasn't up yet, or it was very limited in, in, in scope. Um, so you had a lot of corporations that provided drivers to their various printers, monitors, etc. online. You just accessed their FTP server, navigated their directory structure, and you could find the drivers that you needed and download it. But you had to log in, and you'd log in anonymously, usually with your, your, your uh, anonymous as your username and, and your email address as your, your password. Did it have to be your real pa uh, 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 email address? No. They had no way of checking it. So the problem with that is it tended to get abused. Early on, it wasn't abused that much, but as the Internet became more and more popular and more and more people began to use the Internet, it really became abused. People using uh, FTP sites to store illegal files and, and, and things like that. So you don't see those used an awful lot anymore. Most of the time you're going to tend to see closed sites, sites that require some kind of authentication on the FTP server. It requires a valid username, a valid, uh, a, a valid password, and authorization rights to be able to read and write or just write or just read from a particular directory. Uh, it does tend to get used, let's see, right here, commonly used for uploading web pages. Uh, there are some applications that use FTP a lot for that purpose. Um, there's some other protocols that you can use to, to upload web pages, but FTP is one that's been used quite a bit with Microsoft Ex uh, Expression Web. Uh, Dreamweaver uses FTP, or you can use Dream, uh, FTP with Dreamweaver. So it, it's pretty common to use FTP to be able to modify a web page and then upload it back to the web server so that you've got the new content on the web server. Telnet's another protocol at the HTTP layer, uh, or excuse me, at the application layer. Um, and it's a, it's a program basically that allows you to take control of a remote computer. Uh, it's, you say take control, it sounds glamorous, it sounds like you're hacking it. It's a command line interface, so it's, it's not really user friendly. The only thing you're going to be doing on that remote, com uh, remote computer is issuing command line commands, which certainly you have a lot of control, but you really kind of have to know what you're doing uh, at that level. Um, similar to FTP, you're going to have to log in, you're going to have to be authenticated and authorized on that particular computer. Instant messaging is another application that operates at the application layer. Uh, and uh, I think most of you guys are probably more familiar with IAMing than, than I am, but it's a similar type thing. It's a client and a server. As a client, you're accessing a server out on the web that lets everybody know, hey, I'm online. Now, it's a three-step process, or two-step process that they talk about right here. You access that IAM server, and that IAM server keeps track of the various users across their network of who's online versus who's not. Why? Because if you're not online, you can't communicate. You can't share messages back and forth. So it's not a case of your messages going straight to your friend. 
that you're IMing with, it's going through a middleman. It's going through that IM server. This kind of goes back to what you were saying a little bit earlier. There's kind of that middleman. There is a server there that those messages are going through. So if it's going across the internet, somebody, it's open. I might as well scream it out the window. I'm just saying. Um, especially some of the newer packages. You see a lot of voice and, and video in, in almost every application anymore, it seems like. Um, almost seems weird if, if it doesn't have that capability. So, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to stay in touch, not just with IMing, but be able to, to see and, and, and hear people as well. So, how IMing works, first thing you're going to do is log in and check in with that server, because you've got to register on that network to say, hey, I'm in, I'm available to chat, because if you don't, your friend has no way of knowing that you're online. Video conferencing provides real-time transmission of video and audio signals between two or more locations. Anybody, everybody use Skype? There's other applications out there. Ubu is a, is a free one. Skype, I was reading about a, an article about Skype the other day. Everybody knows Microsoft bought Skype, right? Skype is being integrated with Facebook. They'll be able to make calls directly from within Facebook to friends who don't even have a Skype account. As long as they have a Facebook account, You'll actually be able to video uh, chat with them directly through the Facebook. They already done that. Have they? I haven't seen that yet. Um, but it'll go through the Skype network through through Facebook. So it, it, I think it'll be pretty cool. Um, but it, it, it's a way to, especially if you're an organization, a company, to really kind of curtail some of your costs. Especially if you have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, flying around the country, flying around the country, flying around the world. Uh, those costs can add up pretty quickly. If you can can go to a video conferencing mode, you can save a lot of that, that flight time, that time that an executive is away from their office doing work that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I didn't have it. Uh, maybe one of the links in the in the uh, the syllabus, but there's a, a, a link that I had before at some point that I, I looked at that showed a video conference system from Cisco. There's a couple of them. One of them showed a a video conference room where there was a wall laid out and you walked into the video. The next picture, I think. It, it, well, it's kind of like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind of like this. It, you see that table over there. It's almost, other than the, the frames, it's almost like you're sitting in the same room. There was another one that was called Telepresence. Again, that was by Cisco as well. And there was a holographic image. And that was really cool. It's like you're talking to a person that's, that's right there. Um, except you can see through them. Uh, but uh, so the ability to video conference, teleconference is coming a long way. Now it's probably going to be a few years before we can afford that kind of stuff. But at the corporate level, where they're spending a lot of money on various teams of executives flying around the world, it may make sense for them to be able to do some of this stuff. Um, I was reading something about one of these rooms, and, and they, they're very expensive to put up. Um, I was reading, it, I was thinking somewhere around $100,000 for a basic room like this. And you got to have two of those. There's got to be one on the other end, too. So, As far as video conferencing standards, there's uh, several different standards that are not a real good standard. So there's not some, some kind of agreed upon, this is the main thing that, that everybody's going to use. You've basically got a hodgepodge of, of standards that have kind of taken hold in different environments, different groups, if you will. So. You've got a standard here, H.320, designed for room-to-room -room video conferencing over high-speed phone lines. Family and standards at 323 for desktop video conferencing is just simple audio video conferencing across the Internet. That's what we're going to tend to see a lot. And then you've got MPEG-2, designed for faster connections such as LAN or privately owned WANs. So you don't have, and in, the industry has not specifically said this is the, it's not like TCP IP. Everybody's going to use this protocol and... Everybody's going to build products that, that adhere to those standards. We don't quite have that yet. That's why you end up with Skype having their standards and, and uh, Apple having their standard. You've got these different groups that don't work well together at this point. But at, at some point, that'll change, and you'll be able to make calls from, from one client to a different client. Uh, they won't have to be the same brand, the same, same exact application. Webcasting is kind of the same thing, except it's unidirectional in nature. It's not bi-directional. So it's a, it's a push technology. So it's, can anybody think of a good example of that? There's one, a really good one. YouTube. All 
that video is up there. It's, it's on demand. You go up there, you hit play. All that content's right there. Content sent from a server to a user on demand as you need it. Um, content created by the developer, downloaded as needed by the user, played by a plugin to a web browser. So, again, very easy to use. Why? Everybody knows how to use a web browser. My dad knows how to use a web browser. I mean, he's 70. Yeah, 70. 71, sorry. Um, and same thing, there's no, no standards for that as well. Apple has their own technology. Uh, real, you've got real networks. You've got YouTube. Everybody has their own technology for how they're going to push out video uh, in this manner. So these are, especially the closer you get to cutting edge technologies, the more you're going to have that. You're going to have companies that are pushing the, the envelope in an effort to try to get first mover advantage, in an effort to try to be the standard that everyone else adheres to. Uh, but at the same time, as a, as a user, sometimes it can get complicated a lot because you, you have a situation where I've got Skype, you've got Uvu. Well, we can't, those two applications don't talk to each other. We can't share video uh, using those two applications. We've got to have the same application. Implications for management. Network may be used to provide worry-free environment for applications. A lot of the stuff the application is running uh, um, we have a high degree of uh, capability of, of interoperability between different applications because of these different layers that we're talking about. But at the same time, rapid growth in the amount of, and type of network traffic over time, different implication on network design and management, increased operating costs for the network function. So the applications running on the network have the potential for changing the organization because we, to a degree, have a large degree of interoperability. Again, as we push the envelope, you occasionally have that, that situation where applications don't talk to each other. But for the most part, when we type in that GET request into a web browser, whether it's Internet Explorer, Mozilla, uh, Firefox, or, or, or any of the other web browsers, Opera, any of the other br browsers that are out there, it doesn't matter about the browser because it says HTTP 1.1. It will communicate with any web server that also communicates in HTTP 1.1. Apache, IIS, and any of the other ones that, that might be out there. So um, that is really that chapter in a nutshell. Any questions over the application layer? This is the layer, like I said, that's closest to us as users. This is the one that, that we tend to use the most, or at least kind of indirectly. The applications that we're directly using use that. So that's as close as we normally get. Well, that's all I've got for you this evening. Again, uh, next week, your uh, project, your first version of that. And again, I'm not expecting a lot, but I just want to kind of see some structure to your teams, uh, all that kind of stuff. And we'll kind of go from there and give you some feedback on, on whatever you turn in. You don't have to turn something in. It's, it's up to you. Um, this, this is free feedback for, for you. So um, I encourage you to turn stuff in. But, hey, I'm okay if you don't, because that means I don't have to do anything. So, um, just put it, play, put it like it is. But, um, by all means, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, stop by my office. Uh, again, we're, we're done a little early tonight, so I will be around longer. Uh, but other than that, that's all I've got. Have a good night.